All right, guys, welcome back. This is uh, just me running through the solutions to uh, numbers four through six on that free response test. And uh, number four, first question says, let f be the function given by f of x equals the product of x squared minus 2x minus 1 times e to the x. It says find the limit of that function as x goes to infinity and as x goes to negative infinity. Now, a lot of people get freaked out about this, but don't, okay? This is not a big deal. You just have to think a little bit. So first, let's look at infinity. If I plug in infinity, which I know you can't, but the idea of that, this is a parabola, okay? X squared minus 2X minus 1. Not if you didn't have that part on there, okay? Parabolas, what do they do as you go to the right when they're upward parabolas? That's a plus X squared, so it's, it looks like this. Well, as you move to the right, it goes up to infinity, this is an exponential function. This thing is flat right here, but then goes up to infinity. Both of these are going to infinity. Now, you don't have to know the graphs to do that. If I plugged infinity in there, I get a huge number minus a not as huge number. Minus one is still a huge positive number. And then as e to the infinity is an even bigger huge number. Huge times huge, positive huge. So this one, not a big deal. Surely you can see that that's infinity. I say surely, hopefully. Okay, now... On this one, I'm going to negative infinity. Well, again, if you think about this as a parabola, this part of it, as I go to negative infinity, this is also going up. Now, if you think about it, if I were to plug a negative infinity and square it in there, it's a huge positive, minus two times a negative infinity, you're adding even more of a positive and then just subtracting one. Well, that also, that way of thinking should make sense that this part is going to positive infinity. But what happens here? If I plug a negative infinity in there, the first part gives me a huge positive number, but then I get an e to the negative infinity. Well, if it helps to think about it, move that to the bottom and make it a, sorry, a negative infinity. Move that to the bottom and make it a positive infinity. And what happens when I have a big number here and a big number here? Well, technically what I could do is L'Hopital's rule. But hopefully you'll say, wait, exponential functions grow faster than powered functions. And if it's growing faster on the bottom than it is on the top, it must be approaching zero. And AP took zero, but they also took D and E on this. Um, I'm sorry, they took zero on this. This one they took infinity or they also took D and E. But you're better saying infinity, in my opinion, than you are D and E. It says more, but this is definitely zero, not DNA, sorry. So definitely going to zero because this is a larger, faster growing function than this when you go towards negative infinity. All right, so part B says find the intervals, okay? Find the intervals on which the function is increasing. Well, ask yourself the question, when is a function, when does a function increase? A function increases when its slopes are positive, when it's moving upwards like that. And what is a slope? A slope is a derivative. So I want to know when is the derivative greater than zero. And to figure out where the derivative is greater than zero, I need to find out where it's equal zero and then check in between those values. So how do I find out the derivative of f? Well, I got to go back and do a, uh, a product rule. So looking back at our original function, the derivative of f, it is a product of the parabola, right? It's a product of the parabola and that exponential function. So I'm going to go first d second plus second d first. All right, so here we go. So first, x squared minus 2x minus 1. The derivative of the second of e to the x is just e to the x. And then plus second e to the x times d first. And the derivative of the first part is just 2x minus 2. Okay, now, I want to know where that derivative is equal to 0. All right, and it's equal to 0, so I'm going to set it equal to 0. It's important that you say that. You're going to get, actually, on this problem, you get two points for doing that derivative correctly, but you get a half a point just for putting the equal sign in there. Oh, and by the way, on problem number one, each part was worth a half a point here for a total of one point. All right, and you won't know what those points are again. They just arbitrary, arbitrarily decide. Okay, now, how do I set this equal to zero and solve? A lot of people make the problem of actually distributing the e to the x in there, and then it's kind of a mess. 
So remember, your goal is to get it equal to zero, which you have, and then to get it factored. So let's just start the factoring process now by factoring that e to the x out. And if I take it out, all I have left is all of this stuff added together. So it leaves me with x squared minus 2x minus 1, and then plus 2x minus 2. Remember, keep it set equal to zero. This is an equation we're solving. This now cancels, and I'm left with this. Now, it is very common on the AP test to get a situation like this that you're trying to solve. Guys, I'm, I'm asking myself, when are each of these equal to zero? Guys, exponential functions, which look kind of like that, never hit zero. So if you're ever solving an equation with an exponential function like this, this part will never have a solution. So ignore it. Now, when is that equal to zero? Well, let's set it equal to zero and solve. Adding the three over and square rooting, I get plus or minus root three. So what I've got here, and I, remember, I can use a number line analysis to help me think, but I have to write out what it means. So I'm gonna mark root three, negative root three and positive root three, and I'm gonna ask myself, when is the derivative positive? Well, let me plug values like root three is not quite as small as, is uh, root, negative root four, which is negative two. So I'm gonna check negative two in the derivative. I'm gonna check zero in the derivative, and I'm gonna check two in the derivative, okay? That's the derivative of two. And I'm gonna see whether the slopes were positive or negative there. So when I plug a negative two into my derivative function, and you can plug it in up here, that's a mess. I'm gonna plug it in right here, okay? So what is e to the negative two? Well, e to anything is a positive number. So you really, again, it's always above the x-axis. So e to any number, whether it's a negative or a positive, it's always positive. Well, I'm not really worried about that then. Plug a negative two in there and I get four minus three, which is also positive. So definitely increasing there. Now, if I plug a zero in there, I get a one. Again, always positive. But if I plug a zero there, I get a negative. Positive times negative, decreasing. And if I plug a two in there, again, it's a plus times a plus increasing. So I found out that the derivative was positive here and here. How do I know that? Um, how do I know that the function's increasing there? I just say, state it. F increases, sorry about my handwriting, when the derivative is positive, and this occurs from negative infinity to negative root three, comma, or union, either way, and then root three comma to infinity. And you got another half a point for stating that, All right? And then you got one point for your solution right there. So as long as you can take the derivative and set it equal to zero, that's worth two and a half of the four points here. And if you can get two and a half out of every four points, you're gonna pass this test uh, with flying colors. All right, so let's look at part C. All right, so number four, part C says, find the intervals on the function, uh, for, sorry, find the intervals on which the graph of f is concave down. Okay, well, what does concave down mean? A function is concave down when its second derivative is less than zero. Now again, to do that, I've gotta figure out where the second derivative is equal to zero, and then like I did with increasing, check. All right, so how do I find the second derivative? Now, you could go back and take this part right here, the part that you did, the first derivative, and take the derivative of that, but you're gonna have a kind of two product rules. You're gonna have first to second plus second to first, plus first to second plus second to first. Now you can do that, but what I'm gonna do is take this right here, e to the x, x squared minus three, I'm gonna take that and work with it. So I'm gonna take the, I already had it simplified pretty nicely, I'm gonna use it. Now, the one negative about doing it the way I'm doing it is if you made a mistake in factoring and simplifying, well, then this mistake is gonna cost you again, but that's kind of the nature of, of the AP test. Sometimes that does happen. So if that's the first derivative, then the second derivative is the product rule of this. So first d second plus second d first, all right? And then like before, I wanna know when is that equal to zero? Well again, AP gives you two points. 
actually, hold on. Yeah, they give you two points for finding the second derivative. So even if you had used the unsimplified part from before and you had written out that second derivative correctly, two points. And then if you state that it's equal to zero, again, a half a point. Guys, you have to make these connections and make sure that you label it. Label and write what you're doing. Don't take things like this for granted or labeling it for granted. It's important that you do this, okay? And plus, what if you were to take the second derivative incorrectly? If you have it labeled, you get points for knowing that you needed to take the second derivative. Okay, so how do I set this equal to zero and figure out where it's equal? Again, I need to factor, so I'm gonna factor out that e to the x, and I'm left with that plus that. I'm gonna go ahead and put this in order. You're just adding it all together. Okay, don't forget the equal zero. All right, so how do I tell where this is equal to zero? Well, again, e to the x, e to the x is an exponential function. It's never equal to zero. So I get no help from that, but that I can factor into x plus three, x minus one. All right, you can bring this down if you want, all right? And then, but the only solutions I get from this are at negative three and at positive one. So going to your little number line analysis, mark these on a number line, and I wanna find out where is the second derivative um, negative. So I'm gonna check values like maybe at negative four on the second derivative, maybe like zero and maybe two. And when I plug a negative four in here, what's e to the negative four? Well, still positive. If I plug a negative four in there, you can plug it in here also, but I like, it's easier here to me. Negative four in here gives me a negative, negative four in there gives me a negative. So plus minus minus is plus, concave up. Plugging in a zero in there, e to the zero is one, that's positive. Uh, zero plus three is positive, zero minus one is negative. Plus plus minus, negative, concave down. And then finally, e squared's positive. Two plus three is five, that's positive. Two minus one is positive. Plus, plus, plus is plus, concave up. So this is the only one where it was concave down. So what do I have to communicate? Well, you already said it up here, but I'll say it again. You gotta say, all right, my second derivative is less than zero from um, negative three to one, or on that interval. Therefore, f is concave down here in so many words, okay? Because I showed that. And then to finish this off, by the way, you get a half a point for making that statement. If you would have just up at the very top when we did it, we would have got a half a point for that. And then finally, you get a one half point for this. All right, so again, two and a half points just for knowing that the second derivative is negative and then setting that second derivative equal to zero. I'd actually give you three points, two and a half, and then finally that last half. All right, moving to number five. All right, number five gives you this little diagram and it's asking you some questions. All right, and the graph says, all right, you got this continuous, it says the graph of the continuous function f, and it is continuous. Now it's not differentiable because there's a bunch of corners on it, um, but it says it is continuous, consists of three line segments, one, two, three, and a semicircle. It says g is the function given by this. So I don't know what g looks like, this is f. But I'm, I wanna know, to, I need to know how to find what g of negative six is. Well, if I'm finding g of negative six, it looks like to me they just want me to plug a negative six in there. So let's do that first. g of negative six means, what is the integral from negative two to negative six of the f function? Well, I don't know what the f function's uh, equation is, because it's piecewise, but I do know the picture of it. So if I'm finding an integral of a picture, I'm finding area, I'm accumulating area. Now I'm going from negative two, you gotta pay attention to that, you're not always starting at zero. I'm going from negative two all the way to negative six, which is going to the left. So when I'm accumulating area to the left, stuff on the top is negative, area on the top is negative, area on the bottom is positive. If I'm accumulating to the right, like I will on the next one, uh, then the opposite is true, sorry. Cut off my work here. So this way I'm going negative two to negative six, that's left. So I need to find the area of this. Well, area of a triangle is just one half times the base, which is four, times the height, which is five, but because it's above going left, I gotta negate it, okay? So I do the math on that. One half of 20 is 10, so I get a negative 10. And you've got uh, basically 
I believe maybe just a half a point or a point. Yeah, you just got a plus one for that. All right, let's do G of three. Now G of three says you're going from negative two to three. Again, you gotta pay attention to that. They don't always start at zero. A lot of people, a lot of you guys actually thought that on your test. It starts at negative two. So I'm going from negative two to three. I'm accumulating the area on this function. So this time I'm going from negative two to positive three. That's heading to the right, which means this now is positive, but this part will be negative. Well, how do I do positive area? Well, that's a semicircle. So I have one half, which is semi, of pi radius is two squared. And then I need to add to that this triangle. Now the triangle's negative, so you could say subtract, I'm just gonna put a negative here. And then base, a one half base height. So one half times the base, which is one, times the height, which is a two. Okay, so what do I end up with here? This is a four pi, half of a four pi is a two pi, and then these twos cancel and I get a minus one. All right, so two pi minus one, and that's worth a point. All right, now, second question. Find the derivative of the g function at zero. Well, the derivative of g means I gotta go take my g function and start with it. So I'm gonna copy that g function down again. Okay, and I wanna take the derivative of that. Well, to take a derivative of g, I would have to take a derivative of this integral. So basically you're ddxing both sides. When I ddx the g, I get g prime, or you can write uh, dg dx if you want, all right? And if you ddx this, what happens? See, when I ddx that, I get this, but when I ddx this, second fundamental theorem, okay? So right here, the, the derivative and the integral cancel, and I take this and I plug it in, and then I take the derivative of x, which is just one. And then what do you do with the negative two? You ignore it. All right, and I'll take this time to mention if that x and that negative two were switched, like if the x was on the bottom and the negative two is on the top, all you gotta do is negate it. And if there was an x there and another version of x here, then you kinda do like fundamental. You plug it in and then you plug this one in and then you subtract them. But don't forget to take the derivative of whatever that value is when you do the second fundamental theorem. So what is this saying to me? This is saying that the derivative of g is essentially just the function. So if I want the derivative of g at zero, then I just want f of zero. So for f of zero, I just go to my graph. That's the f function. What is the function at zero? Well, it's that y value, the y value of two. So all of this just ends up being two. All right, and how did you get points for that? You just got a point for your answer. So if you happen to get that, great, right? You got a one uh, plus one, all right, on this particular test. All right, number five, part C. All right, now we're still continuing on with that same function. It says, um, it says find all values of x on the open interval for which the graph of g has a horizontal tangent. All right, let's lock in on that. When would a function have a horizontal tangent? Well, a horizontal tangent line means the slope would be zero. So g slope, the derivative of g is zero. Okay, now if the derivative of g is zero, let's go back, what do we just learn from part b? The derivative of g is the same thing as f. So I wanna know where is my function f equal to zero? Because the derivative of g is f, I wanna know where it's zero. Well, let's go back and look at this. Where did this function hit zero? It hit zero at negative six, it hit zero, at negative two, and at positive two. So the actual value of f was zero at those three values. But on part C, it says the open interval from negative six to three. So I can't count six, I can just use negative two and two. So I'm gonna say that the, the I'm sorry, the derivative of g, which is f, is equal to zero at x equal negative two and two, okay? Now, then it says, determine whether g has a local max, a local min, or neither there. Well, look back at negative two. At negative two, f, or, which is the derivative of g, 
right there, it came in positive, then to zero, then to positive. That meant the derivative went plus to zero to plus. Well, that's not a local min or a local max because a local min or a local max, the derivative has to change signs. In this case, the value of f would have to change signs. So I would say at x equal negative two, there is no local min or max or no local extrema uh, because g prime, which is f, uh, does not change signs. Okay, it does not change signs here. Okay, but at x equal positive two, all right, let's look at positive two. The values of f went from plus to zero to minus, which meant, which meant the derivative of g went plus zero minus. So again, here, because it went plus to minus, I will say there is a local max here because the derivative of g, which is f, changed changed from plus to minus here. Make sure you state these things and try to be clear. You can't say it. Remember, don't say stuff like because it changed signs. They're going to go, what's it? Is it f? Is it the derivative of f? Is it g? Is it the derivative of g? You have to be clear and never use pronouns to talk about what you're talking about. Okay? All right, last part, part D. It says, find all values of x on the interval for which the graph of g has a point of inflection. Okay, it's checking all your rules. Now, remember, critical numbers, these were critical numbers, were a point of inflection on g. Critical numbers occurred when the, de excuse me, when the derivative of g was zero. Points of inflection occur when the what? When the second derivative of g is equal to zero or d and e, okay? Well, if the first derivative of g is f, then the second derivative of g, and you could say g of x if you want, would be f prime, okay? So I'm looking for when the second derivative of g, which is the first derivative of f, equals zero or d and e. So let's go back to our function, our f function, and say where, is the sl where are the slopes of f, zero or d and e? Okay. Now remember, where are the derivatives, zero or d and e? All right, now it said open interval, so I don't look at the endpoints. There, the derivative of f, that's a corner. It's not differentiable. So that one is a d and e here on f prime. f prime would not exist there because it's a corner, or you could argue a cusp, but it's coming in straight. All right, now the slope is zero here. The slope of f is zero. So at zero, the slope is zero. And at two, there's a corner as well. So at negative four, negative two, zero, and two, okay? So negative four, negative two, zero, and um, two, those are possible inflection points. So let's take a look. I'm gonna say there are possible inflection points at x equal negative four, negative two, zero, and two. Now, these are possible ones, like critical numbers are places where there's a possible max or min. Possible inflection points are this. I may, I may have said earlier inflection points are where that occurs. Possible inflection points are where that occurs. Now, how do I actually determine if it is an inflection point? Well, not only does that have to be true, but the graph, the second derivative also has to change signs. So what that would mean is at these values, do the slopes of f change signs there? Well, let's look at the negative four. On the negative four, at negative four, it looks like the slopes go positive to negative. So yes, definitely a point of inflection on g. At negative two, negative, positive, definitely point of inflection. At zero, positive slopes, zero, negative slopes, definitely a point of inflection. But at positive two, negative slopes, Slope doesn't exist, more negative slopes, okay? So at positive two, that's a possible point of inflection, but points of inflection, points or inflection points, points of inflection occur 
at negative four, negative two, and zero, um, because the derivative of g, um, which is f equals zero, or dNe here, and changes signs. And changes signs is easier here because it doesn't matter whether it goes plus to minus or minus, whether uh, f prime went plus to minus or minus to plus, what's important is that it just changed signs, okay? So all of this was me thinking, and I know I rewrote some of this, but this is what's really important. You got two points for stating these correctly, okay? And then you got your last point for stating that. All right, and I also didn't go over the point values on part C. Point values on part C. Sorry, I hope you were able to see all that. Um, if not, I'll show you in a second. Uh, part C right here, you got a half a point each for a total of one point for this, and then you got one point for this and one point for this, okay? And then on part D right here, you got a plus two for showing the points of inflection, all right? Places where um, those were the possible ones, but then you kind of tossed out two because F prime didn't change signs there, therefore G double prime didn't either. So you toss that out and said the points of inflection are those three. And why is that true? Because these were equal to zero or DNE here and you change signs. All right, so those are all the points for number five and then onward to number six. Now guys, I can tell you number six has occurred on every AP test in the history of AP tests. Not, not 6A necessarily, although no, 6A has two. But um, I can, you, can, you are going to have to write an equation of a tangent line and probably use it to approximate a value and you are gonna have to solve a differential equation, guys. It is just a given that's going to occur, it always occurs, and it'll probably worth, be worth a lot of the points that you get. So definitely, we're gonna go over these a ton, but definitely know how to do that. So the first question, let's make sure we know what we're saying. F is a function where F of two is negative eight. Now, right now, that should just jump off the page that they're giving you a point, the point to negative eight. All right, and it says the slope of f is given by that. Well, what does the slope of f mean? Don't write f prime, write dy dx, because f is clearly an x and a y function, okay? But I, you, actually, you don't have to. You could say f prime of x is equal to this, but it's just, it's such bad form to do that because functions don't have y's in there, but I think you'd be still okay as long as you know that, hey, this is the slope, you could write it like slope if you wanted to. Now, if I want an equation of a line tangent to F, okay, then I need a point and a slope. Well, I've got a point, right? Especially had X equals two. I've got a point at X equals two. I need the slope at X equals two. Well, the slope at X equal two, I need the X and the Y value. So to find that slope or that DY DX at x equal two, it's basically at the point two negative eight, because when x is two, the y is the negative eight. Make sure you get both of those values in there. So three times two squared over a negative eight, and when you simplify it, you get negative three halves. Okay, now you actually get one point for finding that slope. All right, but let's get all three points. The next thing, you're gonna to have to find an equation of a line. So y minus the y coordinate gives me plus eight. Take your slope and bring it down. Please do not plug a function in like this in for that. You've gotta find the actual slope there. And then x minus the two, okay? So now that I have it in there, there is my tangent line. You get a plus one for that. Now use it to approximate f of 1.8. So f of 1.8, I wanna know what is the y value when the x is the 1.8. So plug in a 1.8, and you can just plug it in right here if you want. So if I plug in 1.8 and subtract two, what do I get? Well, I get negative three halves, Whoop, negative three halves, and if you do 1.8 minus two, you get a negative 0.2. I'm gonna write my negative 0.2 as just two tenths. That's 0.2 it'll make it easier for me to simplify. And then all I gotta do to solve here is cancel that, negatives cancel, and I get a 3 tenths right here. And then when I subtract eight from both sides, subtract an eight, um, 
you can simplify that any way you want. Um, that's a 0.3 minus an eight is a negative 7.7, .7, or I guess you could find a common denominator like that and get a negative 77 tenths. Any one of these, totally fine, and that's your last point. Okay, now this was a nine point question, that's three points. All right, so remember, you're gonna have to find an equation line tangent to a curve. You gotta know point slope and you gotta be able to find a point and a slope. Never, or I can't think of a time where I actually plugged the formula for slope in there. Don't do it. Take what you know, find that particular slope, plug that in. Okay, now, part B. This was a six point problem on this test and it's normally worth five to six points. Who knows how they're gonna do it this year, but you're gonna get this question. Now, solve the differential equation. Sometimes they're gonna say solve the differential equation. Sometimes they're gonna say find the general solution. Sometimes they're gonna say find the particular solution with this condition. It all means the same thing, okay? So I'm gonna zoom in on this a little bit. Okay, so let's take a look at what I'm gonna do here. So first thing you do to solve a differential equation is what? Separate your variables. Guys, be careful. To get a y from the bottom, the denominator, over to this side, I'm multiplying by a y. Cancels here and leaves me y dy. To get rid of a dx in the denominator, I'm multiplying by a dx and canceling. That makes the dx come over here, 3x squared dx. You get a point for that, okay? So right there, plus one. Again, I don't know how they're gonna figure it out this year, but you got a plus one in years past. Okay, now you're gonna integrate. My guess is when you integrate, you're probably gonna have something like this, like a power rule, and you'll probably have something like one over y to see if you know that natural log rule. That's a lot of what happens. This was kind of an easy year on the front end, but it was harder to solve in the back end. So how do you integrate a y? Add one to the exponent, divide by that new exponent. Add one to the exponent, x cubed, divide by that new and drop down the constant, which cancels. And don't forget your plus C. Now, you got plus one for actually doing that integral and plus one for doing that integral correctly. And if you don't, and you got plus one for putting a C in there. If you don't put the C in there, the greatest you can get is three out of six, and then they quit grading, okay? Don't forget the C. And remember, you don't need a C on the left and the right, just one, because if you move that C over, there are probably different values of C, so you would just get some new constant. So this is fine. Okay, now what do you do from here? You gotta solve for Y. So I've already gotten rid of the three. Let's get rid of the two by multiplying through by two. So when I multiply through by two, it cancels there. I get two X cubed. And technically I get twice that first constant. Well, twice the first constant is just another constant, okay? Now I gotta square root both sides. Because remember, AP requires you to completely solve for Y. So that gives me y, actually absolute value of y, but absolute value of y will give you plus or minus. Now, some people like to get to here, okay? But now, guess what I have to do? Now I have to find the c value. See, if I do this, and I did this on purpose, I have my y value solved, but now what happens when I plug a two in there and a negative eight in there? I'm gonna have to go back and square both sides. So a lot of people like to go, you know what? Rather than do what he just did here and squaring both sides, I'm gonna wait, right, and not do that, right? Don't do this, okay? And let's go ahead and plug in the two negative eight and show AP that you're doing that. So if I plug a two in for the X, that gives me eight times two is 16, drop down the C, and a negative eight in there for Y, remember a negative eight, the whole thing squared is 64, and if I subtract that 16, I get a 48 for C. To me, this is a much better idea than plug the C back in this equation, then go and square root both sides. So I'm plugging that in here before I take the square root. Now when I take the square root, look, I get Y equals plus or minus. And don't bother simplifying stuff, guys. You don't get extra points for trying to factor something out of there. Don't worry about that. Now, question is, is it plus or minus? Now, a lot of you are like, it's both. Well, hold on. According to this, for this particular differential equation, this solution has to make f of two equals negative eight true. 
So when I look at this, if I plug a negative two and a negative eight in there, is it a true statement? Well, let's see, negative eight. If I plug a two in there, I get two cubed is eight times two is 16. 16 plus 48 is 64. And I get negative eight equals plus or minus eight. Is that a true statement? No, it's only true with the plus. I'm sorry, with the minus. So the plus should not be part of this solution, only the minus. Y'all seeing that? All right, make sure you go back and check that. So only the minus part will work on this particular one. All right. All right, so this was just a check right here and you don't need to show that work, I guess. Guys, you're gonna see a differential equation. We're gonna do a lot more of these, but um, definitely. And by the way, how the points work, well, you got four points just for getting to there. Uh, you definitely got a point for showing that you were plugging that in, um, that regardless of how much work you show. And uh, you actually don't get a point for C. You get a point for knowing you need to find C. And then you got a point for having this uh, final equation correct with that negative sign in there for a total of six points. Pretty big deal on the AP test. All right. Hey, if you did a good job on this, I, I put a note there about scoring them um, just to kind of give you an idea of uh, how, how well you're doing at this point. And um, listen, if you can just hit the point, get the place where you're getting half of your points. If you get half the points on this test, guys, um, then you're going to be doing a pretty good shape. Probably looking at a low four, uh, maybe, you know, maybe even a mid-range four because there's not going to be any multiple choice on this one uh, as we have found out. Uh, even though we're going to go through multiple choice questions um, because the multiple choice questions are probably going to be written in a way where you show all your work. So they're just not going to make them work because it's too easy to cheat and nobody's going to be there watching you. You're going to be doing it um, on your computer. All right. Thanks, guys.